and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts on the glorious splendor of your majesty. So we've spent the last few moments repeating words of praise to God that someone else wrote. We came in here to worship God as a community and shout out the greatness of God as to what's been going on in our lives this week and the things we can be thankful for for this week, right? So what I'd like to ask us to do right now is do something that's really hard for most of us. We're not used to shouting out in places like this, random stuff. I want you to shout out your praises to God, your thankfulness to God. You know, praise God for what he's doing in your life. So would you do that right now? Just out loud. They're going to keep playing so it won't feel weird here, all right? So just shout out, out loud right now. Shout your praises to God. Praise his name. Praise his name all over this place. Bless his name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Greatness is unsearchable. One na- generation will commend his works to another. Declare your mighty works. And I pray that through hearing stories of what you did while you walked on this earth, would we focus our attention on you. And I pray in doing so that we would walk out of this room in a few minutes knowing that we came face to face with you. And I pray that it'll change us because every time we come face to face with you, it changes us. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. All right, as always, I hope you have your Bibles with you. If you don't, open up that Bible app. That works. There are Bibles on the back table if you don't have one. If you need a Bible, let us know. They're back there. They're free. Just take it with you. If you know someone that needs a Bible, we want you to get it to them. Go grab one and take it today. Starting a new series today um, called What Moves the Heart of Jesus? There are things that when they happen, Jesus responds in powerful ways. And so as we go through this book of Luke, that's what we're going to be studying for the next bunch of weeks. These are the things that we're going to be watching for. Now, I'm going to throw out a bunch of them to you as we study this, things that have come to my mind, things that have impacted me. But here's what my hope is for you, is that you will have a conversation with those that you're driving home with today, those who you're having lunch with, those who you're in a group with. I'm hoping that you'll have a conversation with them this week as to the things that you're seeing in here that moves the heart of Jesus. So I, I'm, I'm not going to give you all of them. There's so much in here, they're loaded. Four stories. So we'll just start out with the first one. Jesus, Luke chapter 5 tells us, is teaching a group of people. And as, as he's teaching them, I have this feeling that they're pressing in against them. You know how you're in a situation that everyone wants to get close and closer, and they can't hear, and so they're leaning in, and so Jesus turns, and there's two boats behind him, and he, he gets in one of them and pushes out and teaches from the edge of the water. Probably helped with the crowd, probably helped with sound, it probably cooled him off, <laughs> being a little bit away from, from, from the masses, and as, as, as he teaches, he notices that there are some fishermen there, And um, he turns to them, and it it says in verse 4, he had finished speaking, and he turned to Simon, also known as Peter, and he says, put out into the deep and let your nets for a catch. So Jesus says, go out there, do some fishing, get some cat, get some fish. He's just used their boats. They're over cleaning their nets. And Peter looks back at him, and his next words are classic because we get them. They make sense to us. Peter says, Master, I'm in verse 5, we toiled all night, and we took nothing. But at your word, I'll let down our nets. 
I mean, get, get the picture here. You've got professional fishermen. This is what they've done all of their lives. They know the science of fishing. They know water temperature. They know time of day. They know time of night. They know how, how the fish feed when they come to the top because they would put this big net between their two boats and they would um, pull it out there. They knew how to fish. They know that there aren't fish going to be biting at this time of the day. Peter looks back and says, God, this doesn't make sense. But, okay, at your word, we will do it. That moment when what God says makes no sense, but you just do it because you know you should. He does that, and you, you see, he says they enclosed such a large number of fish, their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boats to come and help them. They came and they filled both boats, and they began to sink. <laughs> wow. And it's Simon's response that is so important here. He responds, it says this, but when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O oh Lord. And there's so much packed into that little statement. There is in Scripture, every time someone comes into the presence of God, where they fall on their face, humbled before God. And that's what he does. And he says, there he uses the word, O oh Lord. It's, it's there that he recognizes that he is the Lord. He is in charge. He realizes, if this don't come otherwise, God, you're in charge. Didn't make sense. He falls on his face. Calls himself a sinner. Psalm chapter 51, verse 17, says something very similar to Isaiah 66. Verse 2, in fact, on, on your program today, there's a blank spot on the back side where you can take notes. I'd write down um, Psalm 51, 17, Isaiah 66, verse 2, but I, I'm just going to read Isaiah 66, 2. It says this, but um, this is the one to whom I will look, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and who trembles at my word. You know, who, who, does, who does God respond to? Um, the heart of Jesus. What moves the heart of Jesus? That person who is humble and of contrite spirit. And in that moment, big bad fisherman Peter, professional fisherman Peter, falls before God, humble, contrite of heart, and says, God, you be my Lord. I'm a sinner. And it's in that moment that Jesus calls him into service. And he says, you know, you've been going after fish. I'm going to up your game. And from here on out, you're going to be fishing for men. And I'm guessing that Peter didn't fully understand exactly what the implications of what that meant. <laughs> you, you picture this, fishing for men. I don't quite understand that. Jesus would call him to go out to share the good news, the gospel, and to draw men to himself. And the moment when he was obedient was something as simple as fishing, and the moment that he recognizes in the midst of that he is dependent on Jesus, Jesus gives him a promotion and says, I have something way bigger uh, for you to do. I have another assignment for you. That's the first story. Keep that in the back of your mind. Second story starts in verse 12. It's um, a story about a man full of leprosy, this was a disease that was absolutely horrific and feared in that time. The disease basically killed off and desensitized the nerve endings in the body. So, you know how it is when you cut yourself with a piece of paper and you pull back, you slice your kni a knife over it, you pull back, you, you touch that iron skillet and grab it and you realize, whoops, that's hot. I didn't realize that handle would be hot and you, you let go real fast and grab a hot pad instead. You go around the corner of your bed. Anyone ever hit your toe on that corner leg? Oh, I hope you didn't have to say any bad words there. Well, you do that every night 
um, because you don't realize it's there. You know, I'm just carefully going around that because I don't want that pain again. But when you don't know you have pain because those nerve endings are deadened, eventually um, you lose those digits. And from um, what I read about this disease, these people, their ears would get really, really thick. Their nose would get collapse in over their sinuses. Their hands would become claw-like, and their face would get a, a scary look, almost that of a lion. They would begin to smell like they were rotting because these different parts of the flesh that, that were falling off and in their time, they had no idea what it was. What they did know is that this was highly contagious. So when someone got it, they pushed them out to the outskirts and told them that they could not be near. And if for some reason they were to come near, they had to shout out and scream out, unclean, unclean. And if they didn't do that, what would have occurred is they would have been stoned. So here's someone who was used to living with a family, living in um, relationship, being in business, all of a sudden a castaway, cast as far out as, as you could imagine in society. Um, today they've learned a little bit more about this disease. Uh, it's called Hansen's disease. And um, in our time, um, I believe in 2015, uh, there were about 63 cases in America. And... Um, this man decides that he would rather die than to keep on living like this. Um, I, I'm, I'm s certain that some of you know exactly what that, what that means. So this guy comes into the city, and he comes towards Jesus. So when we talk about he'd rather die, I mean that seriously, I mean that literally. Because the guy like this comes in, he's not yelling unclean, unclean. They're going to stone him. And when he saw Jesus, uh, I mean, verse t um, uh, middle of verse 12, and when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Remember, he's a guy that has to yell unclean. He says, Lord, if you will. Just a, a little side note on that. We see a lot of displays of these kinds of moments these days where people command Jesus and demand Jesus to heal them. I find it interesting that he says, if you will, if you would choose to do so, Jesus. And Jesus' response was, I will. And he says, be clean. Be clean. And immediately, the leprosy left him. Can you imagine Jesus touching this guy? Can you imagine all the people around watching in and seeing this? And, and Jesus reaching in there and touching him. You know, I used to work many years ago in the health industry. They have these isolation rooms. I had to put on gowns and masks and gloves and double gloves and all this kind of stuff, all this preparation to go in, and Jesus touches him. And then Jesus says, hey, by the way, go to the priest, because in those days it was the priest that would diagnose this kind of stuff, and when you go there, he will verify that you're truly healed. And, and really what's being clearly stated here is when you are healed, it is verifiable. And he is healed, and he is healed completely. Another one. So we got Simon Peter catching all those fish. We have the leper. Now we have a guy who's paralyzed. He's on a stretcher. And in that time, there was the mentality and the thought process that if you were paralyzed in this kind of way, you must have done something bad enough and sinful enough that would cause this. So this guy lived with this weight and this burden of his sinfulness, and he was concerned what to do with that. By the way, in the book 
of John verse 9, or chapter 9, verse 2, it, sa it says this, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents, because they had this mentality, someone sinned, something happened to get there, and Jesus' response was, not that either had sinned, but so that the works of God may be displayed in him. So you have this guy who's on a stretcher. He believes that he's in this position because of his sin. His friends come and they pick him up and they take him down through the city streets. And we're talking about narrow city streets in a town called Capernaum, uh, a place where Peter's home was, where Jesus had the home base of his ministries. They take him down through these narrow streets. They arrive at the house, and um, we believe that was Peter's house. They arrive at Peter's house, where Jesus is inside teaching a crowd of people. And when they get, they realize this house is packed out. There is no way to get in through the doors to get this stretcher in to the front of the room. But in his mind, and in his friend's mind, they were not for a minute going to let the crowds keep them from Jesus. We let a lot of things keep us from Jesus. They weren't going to hear to it. I'm, I'm very drawn by this guy's friends. They are passionate about what they're doing. They want to get their friend to Jesus. So they go up the, th these ladders and steps to get to the rooftop, which in that case may have been like a big veranda, sort of a deck-like area. It tells us here that there were tiles on top of this roof. These are probably earth-baked tiles. And below that were the timbers that went across, laid on top of that um, those timbers would have been different reeds that they would have placed there, and then they would have put some sort of a mud substance on top of that to sort of create almost a, a hard layer, a hard surface, and then the tile on top of that. They tear all of this off of the roof and bust a hole in this roof because they want to get down to Jesus. Now, I understand I get in a very sensitive territory when I talk about tearing roofs off. There's still no one sitting up there. I'm not sure if there's a reason for that. We understand what it means to have a roof taken off. I thought about that when that came through here. Can you imagine? They're up there. You know, it's like when we get distractions up here on the stage. Everyone's staring at it, looking at it, just totally distracted. Jesus is teaching away inside of this house, packed out with people, and all of a sudden you see a little particles of dirt falling and then you see a stick fall and, and Jesus sort of moves out of the way and pretty soon you look up and there's this big hole in the ceiling and before you know I mean no one's expecting this I have a feeling Jesus fully knew what was going on they're lowering this stretcher down through that roof hole that they've made and placing it there in front of Jesus wow what a task to get their friend to Jesus. And just a side note, what, what are you willing to do to get your friend that needs Jesus to Jesus? If you still have your Bible open, verse 20 says this, when they saw, or when he saw their faith, the friends and this guy, so when Jesus saw their faith, he said, man, your sins are forgiven you. Evidently, because it'll say here in a verse later, Jesus knows the heart. Evidently, Jesus knew that this man, the thing that he wanted more than anything was to have his sins forgiven. And what, what, they, what he saw in them was their faith. You remember a few weeks ago, we talked about faith alone. See, it's by grace alone by faith alone, and this verse, uh, in, in another translation, actually, I'd call it a paraphrase, so what I read out of is the English Standard Version, so it's a very literal translation of the 
uh, of the original language. A paraphrase is a little more like if you just put it in your own words. So sometimes we'll do that. We'll read through a scripture and sort of put it in our own words. This amplified trend, um, paraphrase says this, and when he saw their confidence in him springing from their faith, he said, man, your sins are forgiven you. I like that confidence springing from their faith. I know that what my friend needs is Jesus. And they saw, Jesus saw that they were just sort of like, that'd probably be a helpful thing, let's see. No, they, they, they knew that he needed that. They would go to any lengths, in fact, tearing off the roof of a house, we'll deal with the ramifications later, got to get this guy to Jesus. And he looks at him and says, your sins are forgiven. What moves the heart of Jesus when you want your sins forgiven? When living with that weight and that burden of your sin for so long, you just say, I'm done. I need to get to Jesus. Nothing else will satisfy that need for the forgiveness of sins that make you right to God and to take away that gap between you and God, but to come into Jesus for the forgiveness of sin. And you do that through faith springing forth from you. I haven't said much about it yet, but the next phrase says, the scribes and the Pharisees began to question him, saying, all the way through these different um, stories, I, I highlighted every time the scribes and Pharisees were to speak. And I'll talk about them a little bit more here in a minute, but these guys are the guys who have basically turned their spiritual experience into a formula. And so they've studied every little thing, and they've tried to understand every little thing, and as a result of that, they've extrapolated it much further than it was ever meant to be extrapolated to a point that they basically created their own rules so that when the Jesus that they're looking for, the Messiah that they're waiting for, shows up, they miss him because he doesn't fit their neat little tidy little system. And so they're constantly pushing back on them. And, and, he, and they should have seen through what he's doing that this is God. And so they question him and says, who is it that speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? So here in this moment, they get it. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus has just said he forgives their sins, but he doesn't believe them. And Jesus responds, because it says here he perceives their thoughts. He knows your thoughts. He knows what you're thinking. He knows what you long for. He knows what's on your heart. He answered them and said, why do you question in your heart? Which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, rise and walk? That's sort of a hard one. You can say your sins are forgiven, but is that verifiable? You say rise and walk. If the person doesn't get up and walk, you sort of toast. So Jesus says, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority. I like that word, authority, on earth to forgive sins. So you can know that he can do that. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And immediately he rose up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home glorifying God. And the next verse says, and everyone else will stand there glorifying God also in amazement. This was one of those wow moments. And the Pharisees in that moment should have seen it. Because he said, hey, you, I'm answering your question. And now I'm going to verify it with a healing. And those who have soft hearts towards God respond and glorify him. Those with hard hearts walk away going, nah, nah, no. Oh, Jesus responds big time to a person who longs for forgiveness. So like Peter recognizes God, I'm a sinful man. This guy comes, God, I'm a sinner. I want forgiven. One more story. Verse 27. After this, he went out and he saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. Reading through this, it'd be very easy to smooth over this because we're going to find out here in a moment that the tax gatherers were hated people, but that shouldn't be much of a surprise to us. We, we don't like anyone thrilled about paying taxes here. I mean, 
you know, we, th- that's not something that we, we, we like. It's not something we're real pleased with. This guy, Levi, who's also known as Matthew, was a Jewish man. Now, you may remember that at that time, Israel ha- was being ruled by Rome. And all the taxes were going there for the benefit of Rome. Rome had come in and grabbed some people within their nation, Israel, Israel, and said, hey, I want you to be a tax collector. We'll pay you. You go grab the money from, from the people. And oh, by the way, you know, this will be your franchise, so you can also go so far as to charge them whatever you want and get money out of it and get kickbacks for yourself. I mean, imagine if all of a sudden something happened where we're no longer a sovereign nation. So right now we're frustrated because the monies go, go to Washington or go to Harrisburg or go to our local community. But, you know, you actually realize they're staying in the country for our own benefit and our good. Imagine if another nation took us over now and they began to um, come in and take our monies from us and take them out. And we didn't have the basic um, resources that we were used to. But uh, they came in and they co-opted some people from among us to be the ones to collect that for us, we would really have a visceral response against them, and that was the case here. The people hated them. No one was a friend. They had sold out to Rome. They had sold out to that other country, and now they were extorting, should we say, their own um, brothers And if you couldn't pay or you didn't pay, they would come after you for that money with 50% interest. I mean, it's a bad, bad deal. So when Jesus comes and says this guy, Levi, or otherwise known as Matthew, and says to him, come and follow me. Even his own disciples who had already started following him have to look and scratch their head and say, what? He said, make any sense. Why would Jesus go to a guy like this? And again, you know, these these scribes and Pharisees, they're also totally taken back by this. They see Jesus after this, because Matthew invites all of his buddies in after Jesus calls them. You gotta hear about this. You gotta hear about Jesus. You gotta meet Jesus, because that's what we do when we meet Jesus. We tell everyone we can find about it. And, and so the, he calls all his friends, and it, it says here, it says he calls the, um, the other tax collectors and others to recline at the table. Then down just a couple um, verses in verse 30, it says um, the tax collectors and sinners, because that's, that's who they hung out with. These were the marginalized. These were the ones that everyone said, no, you are so bad, you're not one of us. That's who the tax collectors hung with. And now here's Jesus having dinner with them. And these Pharisees and keepers of the law, they, these religious people who had it all figured out down to an equation and a formula, they were like, this makes no sense. And Jesus responds. He gives them an answer that is really, really helpful to all of us. If you have your Bibles open, look at verse 31. And Jesus answered them and said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. And then Jesus said, I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. Healthy people, they're not in need. Sick people are. Jesus said, I'm not looking for righteous people or people that think they're righteous. I'm looking for sinners, and I want to give them the opportunity to repent. I don't know about you, but just to hear who Jesus would come to really opens up that door to let us realize that whoever we are, wherever we're at, Jesus says, you're the one I'm looking for. What moves the heart of Jesus? A few years ago, I was with a friend, and he was talking to me about um, some of his hiring practices. He was also a pastor of a very large church, and he, he was telling me, he says, you know what, um, 
I, I never hire someone unless they have gone through really deep waters, really tough stuff. Those who have been hurt deeply, so they're the only ones that I hire. Especially or only if they have proven to be dependent on God through it and come through the other side. Because he said, those guys that have it all together and have all the answers, I've figured everything out, and have never gone through the fire, he says, I find they're all self-dependent. So I ask myself the question in the midst of this thing, wow, so at what point am I a person who is dependent on God? I mean, really, seriously, I would slice a roof in, uh, a roof in the hole, a hole in the roof to get to Jesus. I'd fall flat in my face and say, I'm a sinner. I mean, how dependent on, on God am I? And how much am I just self-sufficient and I've got this, except for that one little moment where I freak out and I go, I help. What moves the heart of Jesus? That person is so dependent on him. What moves the heart of Jesus? That person that you would never expect that he's just reaching out in compassion and love to. What moves the heart of Jesus? Think about Peter. A man who recognizes that Jesus is God and he recognizes his own sinfulness. That leper, I would rather die than live like this. I'm going to Jesus. Even if they stone me on the way, I am going to Jesus. That paralytic, I don't want to live with this guilt of this sin on me any longer. I want forgiveness. Jesus says, oh, you're the kind of guy I'm looking for. Levi, Matthew, <laughs> Not looking for a guy who has it all together. Not looking for a guy that's all cleaned up. But a guy who is sick. A guy who is a sinner. A guy that is so in need of a savior. I have a feeling I've described most of us in here today. my hope is that as you leave here today that one of these little stories of who Jesus reached out to you'll go that's me that's me for me it's Peter I got this Lord I got it I, I've done this before I can handle this part of my life Hear those words, self-dependent, self-sufficient. And it causes me to fall and just go, God, <sighs> what a sinful man am I. Some of, some of us in this room right now, are, we hear how Jesus responds to the faith of someone that brings their friend to Jesus. You're like, ah, the only one thing that's going to help my friend right now is to come to Jesus. And you go get a bunch of your friends, you just go double team them, triple team them, and go, we got to get you to Jesus. Because I know that's the only thing that's going to help you. That's why we say those words around here all the time, Christ first. It's all about Jesus. So I hope that today, as you think about what moves the heart of Jesus, 
you'll put your eyes on Jesus. And you'll become dependent on him and say, I need you. So I'm going to just give you a moment to bow your head. Which one do you relate to? Peter? The leper? No one's coming near you. The paralytic? You feel like you've sinned too much. The tax gatherer? You don't even fit into this place. Jesus is holding out his hand to you. He's touching you. He's forgiving you. He's healing you. He's inviting you in. I wonder if right now, maybe you've never trusted him with your life. You say, Jesus, I'm, I, I want that forgiveness. Would you forgive me of my sins? I know you died on the cross to forgive me of my sins. Would you do that right now? Would you come into my life? I need that forgiveness. Man, no one has to drop you through a roof, but if you only knew what it took to get you here today, what it took to get you onto listening to this podcast, what it took you to get to listen to this live stream, what got you onto Facebook this morning and why you pressed the watch button, I don't know. And all of a sudden you realize that was God. That was God. And he called me here for this moment. Connected with Peter, paralytic, leper, tax gatherer. Oh, Jesus, I need you. Just like they called on you, I'm calling on you. <laughs> I'm done being self sufficient. That's got me nowhere. I need your help. Would you come into my life, Jesus? Maybe you prayed that before. But I'm going to invite you to pray it one more time. You know, He came into your life then, but that's grown so cold and you've grown so far away. I I just need to come to you as a sinner dependent on you to be my God. Pray for all those that are praying that prayer right now, Lord God. Doing work with you. We want want to do the things that move your heart. We're just thankful for you being there for us. Thank you for loving us. celebrate those things around here. Love to talk to you. I, you know, maybe, maybe you feel comfortable coming to tell me. I'd love if you would. If not, maybe you'd like to go into the prayer chapel afterwards. I'll pray with you out there. By the way, there's a whole wall of thanksgiving out there. Just write your thanksgivings on that wall. Thank the Lord for saving your soul today. Um, they'd love to pray with you. Hey, if you won't tell them or tell me, tell someone else. Tell, tell someone next to you. Tell, tell your Spouse, tell some friend at work tomorrow. Just start telling the word. That's what we see happening here. Pass it on. It's awesome. It's exciting. It's the best day, best choice you ever made. It will change your life. It will radically transform your life. Right now, we're going to give you the opportunity to give your gifts and your tithes and your offerings back to the Lord. At the end of the rows are buckets. Take it. Pass those across. If you're sitting at the end of the row, would you grab that bucket and pass it across? Put your gifts in there. I, I just want to say so much thank you for giving. Right this time of year, it's crazy how like every other day is a you know giving Tuesday or extraordinary give Friday or it seems like there's always something. But here's I was thinking about it this week, guys. I was thinking I get to be a part of a group of people that are generous all year long who know that we don't relegate our generosity to one day in a time of the year when everyone's sort of emotional about this. You're just saying, no. Um, What I have isn't even mine, it's God's. And I just give the first 10% back to God saying, it's yours. And I want 
want you to know he's blessing that. Lives are getting changed in this church. We're seeing people getting saved. We're seeing people get growing up in their faith, getting discipled. We're seeing people being sent to do missions work. Your kids are getting trained up. It's because you are so generous and you're so faithful. And I know that you'll continue to do that even as the end of the year comes right now. So thank you so much for that. Thank you so much. I wonder if we could throw the um, words, the, this next song that we're going to close with up on the screen in a moment. Look at those words. Oh, Lord, please light the fire that once burned bright and clear. I'm convinced there's some of us in this room today. It's, it's so easy to wander away. It's so easy to get off track. Would this be your prayer this morning? Would you sing this as a prayer? Maybe right now you just want to kneel in your chair words. Maybe you want to just come to the front and kneel and pray those words. Or maybe you just want to stand up and lift your arms up. Lord. But join the team as we sing these words. Lord, light the fire. Hey, I want to pray for you before we leave. And I, I wonder if you just put on your mind right now someone that you want to bring to Jesus. And you have enough faith that God can help you to do that. You know, any names coming to your mind right now? I'd like us in this room to bring those names before Jesus. And some of us need to do that during the week because there's no way to do it on a weekend with them. But some of us have no idea how we do it during the week, but right now we're going to just pray, God, would you give us you that opportunity to do that? Next week, we're going to be doing baptisms. By the way, we'll baptize you if you'd like to. Just give us a call this week, and we'll talk to you and get dialed in for that. We have some stories in this room not too long ago of people that got saved right during one of those services hearing those testimonies came up here and got baptized wouldn't it be cool if you had enough faith to bring a friend next Sunday to hear those testimonies and see them come before Jesus and say I need your forgiveness get saved so I ask you would you bring that name before the Lord right now would you just bow your head just think of that name and say Lord name it in. Give me the faith it takes to bring them before you. Give me the opening this week. Have them ask me the right question. Have something happen in their life that they feel like I'm the one they could come to and ask about it. Give me the boldness just to bring it up. Give me that opening to invite them to church next Sunday so I can hear those testimonies. Oh God, bring each person that's praying for a friend. Sometimes we worry so much about ourselves and try to figure out how we can be a little bit better, how we can be a little closer to you. There's a whole world around us going to hell. And if they don't meet you today, they're going to be lost. Some of these people are wanting forgiveness and they just wish someone would ask them, just wish someone would give them some answers, that someone would give them a lift. But they look so far away from you and they seem so hardened, and yet sometimes, Lord, I sense that you're just opening up those doors. I pray that we'd be alert to that this week. That we'd sense your prodding in that. So right now in this room, we bring those names all before you. Just in your heart right now, say that name out loud in your heart. Jesus. Oh, Lord Jesus. Do a work in that person's life right now. We know that you can touch them wherever they're at. And I pray that you'll give us the faith. their day, help their relationships, help their finances, help their, um, their work situation, help their marriage. I pray that you'll um, help them just purify their mind. I pray that you'll remind us to open up your book and read it this week, your Bible and read it, that you'll remind us to uh, pray this week. Very close to you on this week, where we can just spend a lot of time saying thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus, on this Thanksgiving weekend. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks so much for being here. Love being together. Listen, there's no rush out of here. Sometimes the building's empty in 30 seconds. <laughs> encourage each other. I think that's really important right now. So meet someone new, encourage them. 
finish off this coffee. It gets thrown away if you don't drink it. So fill up your big mugs. God bless you. Thanks.